I'm going to be talking about uh, a new programming language that I've been working on. It's called Unison. And uh, it's, it's a really big, big project, a lot of new stuff in it. And so I'm just going to be focusing on one uh, small piece of it, which, is, which I'm very excited about, which is its support for building uh, very large-scale distributed systems in hopefully very little code. So just to motivate things a little bit, uh, this slide is very much motivated by uh, my, or inspired by my daughter, uh, Ariana. Uh, this is her, her with her, her brother on the right there. Uh, and, and yeah, programming is, is awesome, right? It's, it's, it's fun, um, it's, it's interesting. Um, and I, I guess when I think about the times that I am, uh, that, that I most enjoy programming, it's, it's when I'm able to, to focus on like the essence of the problem, the essence of the code. Um, so, you know, the, the core data structures, the algorithms, uh, you know, the business logic, the stuff, the stuff that I'd actually be excited to, to tell, you know, a, a fellow programmer buddy over lunch or something. Um, and, and programming is it's certainly so, some of that. Uh, and, uh, but it's, it's, not, it's not all that, right? There's, there's a certain amount of kind of boring or, or tedious stuff we have to do. Uh, maybe stuff that feels needlessly complicated, and I don't know how many people sort of feel this way, but uh, y you know maybe sometimes it even feels like that's the majority of what you have to spend your time doing as as a programmer. And so, yeah, I've I've really wanted to to try to do something about that for a while, and and that's kind of why I started working on Unison. So I think that a, a lot of the sort of boring stuff we have to do as programmers, it, it has, has sort of a root cause, which is that our, our current model of what uh, programming is, is, is being sort of crammed into this tiny little box. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by that. So I'll start by making a, what I think is a somewhat troubling observation, which is that what we currently think of as a program is actually just a description of what a single operating system process should do, right? In the sense that you, you run your program and what happens? An operating system process starts up. And you know, while it's certainly true that that OS process can communicate with uh, other processes, there's a certain amount of friction in doing that, right? Um, you know, you generally need to work out some sort of protocol that these processes are going to use to communicate. Uh, maybe you're even, you know, parsing and serializing JSON and issuing HTTP requests. You're doing stuff that's it's not very interesting, and it feels sort of ancillary to, to the real thing that you're, that you're actually working on. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess, if you sort of look back at the, at the sort of history of computing, there have been uh, various times where we've needed to expand our, our concept of what a program is. So it sort of used to be, you know, in the early days uh, of computing, by the way, I don't know if Joe's in the audience, but Joe's talk uh, yesterday was, was great. Uh, but yeah, in the early days of computing, you know, a, a program was just a description of a single sequential thread of control, right? And that, that worked pretty well for a while um, until, you know, computers started getting more and more powerful and we started building these multitasking operating systems so we could kind of better take advantage of all that power. And uh, so with that, we got this notion of the, the operating system process. And, uh, you know, that we were sort of writing programs with that sort of model of what a program was for a while, and it, and it worked pretty well, kind of up through, I would say, kind of the era of, the sh of shrink wrap software, right? Because in the era of shrink wrap software, it was, you know, you sort of wrote your program and, and compiled it, you know, to your executable, and, and you're sort of done with the, the software writing process, you know? You would stamp that on CDs and, and ship it, and, and you were just printing money at that point, right? Um, okay, but, but things have changed in, in the last 20 years or so. So now we're, we're in the age of the internet. And uh, I love this cheesy 
clip art, by the way. Particularly that, that uh, middle image there is, is, is really great. But uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, now we're in the, this age of the internet. We're building these larger and larger software systems. And, and it is increasingly the case, I would say, that what a single operating system process is doing is like a, this tiny percentage of, of what we actually need to be able to specify to build a, a, a large-scale system. Uh, so we need to be able to talk about all these other things. We need to talk about uh, provisioning of computing resources, uh, deployment, orchestration, uh, scaling, uh, you know, failover, all, all these other concepts that our, our languages aren't really the best at, at talking about. And so I, I would say we kind of have this gap. It's the gap between what our programming languages can talk about and specify well and the set of things that we actually need to specify to build a large, a large system. And so we've kind of been filling that gap with all these different, I would say, special purpose technologies. So yes, we need to sort of fill that gap somehow. Uh, but I would say the way to do it isn't necessarily with, with special purpose technologies like this, which are, they're, they're kind of like machines they're, or appliances. They, they solve sort of one problem well, but they're not a, a general purpose tool. Um, they don't have the same power that a real programming language uh, have, where you can, you know, a real programming language, you can abstract over things, you can compose things however you want, you can factor the code in lots of different ways. Um, and so we, we sort of, we see this proliferation of, of technologies and, and things that you have to, to think about. Um, and they're sort of always going to be insufficient because we're, we're always going to come up with some new use case that, that isn't covered by these existing sort of special purpose tools. And it also just, I don't know, personally, it makes me very unhappy to have to think about, you know, you might have to think about 15, you know, some very large number of these different technologies that you have to pull together to, to assemble a large, a large system. And, you know, I, I don't like having to think about that many things when, I, when I'm programming. Um, okay, so I think a better model is rather than sort of filling that gap with special purpose tools, I want to simply expand our concept of what a program is so that it can talk directly about things like provisioning, deployment, orchestration, large multi-node computations. I want to just be able to describe all that with a single program. And, and that's sort of where uh, Unison comes in. And that's what Unison is, is attempting to do. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to sort of introduce Unison. Uh, I'm going to work up to the code for a search engine in Unison. It's going to be very little code. Uh, and so we'll sort of get to see, you know, what it's like programming in a language that can, can talk about all these other uh, concerns that we currently have to specify sort of in other ways. Uh, and then I'll, after that, I'll talk a little bit about sort of how this is all done, uh, like in the, in the Unison runtime. Okay. So just as a, a quick intro here. So Unison is a statically typed, uh, purely functional programming language. I would say it's, it's probably most similar to Haskell, if you've, if you've heard of that language. Um, just to, oh, so, but it has sort of this magic power, and that magic power is we can transport an arbitrary Unison uh, value to another Unison node. And I'll, I'll show you how that works. So just some basic syntax here. Uh, to apply a function to some arguments, we just list the function name and then the arguments separated by spaces. That's that first example there. And then uh, type signatures look a little bit different than you might be used to. Um, this is the, the type signature for a sort function. Um, so it takes an ordering of A, a vector of A, and it returns a vector of A. So we just have the, the arguments and the results separated by these uh, arrows here. Okay, so um, let's look at our first uh, function definition. This is the factorial function. And uh, it's this function that it's doing a couple things. First, we take the numbers from one to n, and we're, then we're just going to multiply them all together with this fold left. 
And we could leave off the type signature. We don't need to say that it's a function from number to number. Uh, unison is inferred, so that would, that would be figured out for us if we didn't supply it. Okay, so we can evaluate factorial sort of locally on our current node, or we could evaluate factorial at another node. So here's kind of how that works. So, so now we, our factorial function is taking a node, which we'll call Alice. And you can see in the body of the function, we, we're starting this remote, I'll call it a remote block. And in the remote block, the first thing that we do is we transfer control of the computation to the Alice node. And, and so now the rest of the computation is going to happen on Alice. And so what, the first thing we do on Alice is we're just going to evaluate this pure operation uh, factorial then. And what will actually happen at runtime is, is the, potentially the definition of factorial will be synced to Alice's node if she doesn't already have it locally. Uh, but yeah, so this is, oh, and, and then one more thing is you'll note the return type of this function is now a remote number. It's not just a, a number. So that's sort of signifying that this is a, a function that may, whose evaluation may happen on, on multiple uh, unison nodes. Okay, so let's keep going. So most interesting uh, applications have some sort of persistent state that they need to manage, right? And so currently Unison has, has one uh, built-in type. It's a, just a local uh, persistent key value store, uh, which is called index. And here's a, a subset of its, of its API. We can, we can do two, uh, three things. We can create an empty uh, index. We can insert a key value pair into the index, and we can look up uh, a key in the index and get back an optional value. And, uh, you know, th these key and value types can be anything at all. We don't need to, you know, specify a serialization format or how we're going to translate it to the database, anything like that. Uh, and then just a couple new things. Unit is... Uh, it's just sort of like void. It's, you know, there's only one value of that type, called, also called unit. Uh, and then optional, we use that if we may or may not uh, be returning a value successfully. There's two cases. It could be some or it could be none. Okay, so here's an example of, of using uh, index. So we, again, we have a remote block. First thing we're going to do in our remote block, we're going to transfer control of the computation to Alice. Now we're on the Alice node. Uh, Alice is going to create the empty index, and she's going to insert uh, a couple key value pairs into the index. Then we transfer control of the computation back to Bob. And then Bob is actually going to do a lookup in that index that Alice created. So, so these uh, index values are, are serializable, and they can be transported to other nodes, just like any, anything else. And so that, that lookup that Bob does will actually be contacting Alice's node because that's where the, the index uh, is actually stored. It's in Alice's local storage. So, so these index values, they're not like sort of global distributed mutable state. Uh, they're sort of owned by a particular uh, node that, that created them. All right, so, so far some like pretty simple, I hope, uh, you know, primitives here and, and nothing, nothing too complicated. Uh, at least at the sort of API level. But we have kind of most of what we need to actually build a search engine in about 15 lines of code, uh, at least the core of the search engine. Uh, <laughs> so before we sort of get, get to the actual Unison code, let's, let's take a step back. What, what's the actual data structures and, and algorithms we're, we're going to be using for our search engine? So really simple search engine you have some sort of search index. You have a mapping from a search keyword to a set of URLs which contain that keyword, right? So the keyword programming, you know, there's a bunch of URLs that contain, uh, whose page uh, content contains the, the, the word programming, and same thing for these, these other keywords. Uh, we could have, you know, so a more flexible notion of what a keyword is. It could be, you know, a bigram or a trigram or some processed form of, of, of keywords, but uh, we're just going to ignore that for, for now. Okay, so to do a search in this index, 
you, uh, you know, it's pretty simple. We say we're doing a search for unison programming. So there's two keywords in our, in our query. So what we do is we look up in our index, we look up for uh, what's the set of URLs that contain uh, programming, what's the set of URLs that contain unison, and then we're gonna just take those two sets and intersect them. All right, simple. So, so let's, uh, let's look at the unison code. Um, there's gonna be a, a few new things here, so I'm gonna you know, walk through it, so don't be alarmed if there's anything uh, that you don't uh, quite understand yet. So, so this is the, this is the, the advertised 15 lines of code here. Uh, <laughs> so let's just sort of get oriented. Let's look at our type. Um, so our search function, it takes a, a number of search results that we want to return. So we might not want the whole set. We might want just the top 10. It takes a query in the form of a vector of keywords and it takes a search index, um, and then it returns a, a vector of URLs. Uh, okay, what's search index? So search index is this D index type, which, which I'm gonna explain in, in a minute. But uh, the first thing we do in, in the implementation here is we're gonna loop through our query, and for each uh, keyword in the query, we're gonna look up the set of URLs for that, um, for that keyword. So now we have a, a, a list of these sets of, of URLs, and we're gonna intersect them. I guess before we do that, we're gonna, any, any keyword that is sort of not found in the index, we're gonna map that to the empty set. Um, once we've done that, we're gonna take all these sets, we're gonna intersect them, and we're only interested in the top 10 or whatever, whatever it is, so we're going to take the first, uh, you know, uh, limit of, of those, of that set of URLs. So there's a couple new things. So one is this index traversal dot intersect business. So we're actually a little bit uh, smart about how we're doing this, these set intersections. We're doing the minimum amount of work necessary to just generate, say, the first 10 results. So we're not, we're kind of like lazily producing that result set rather than sort of fully instantiating, you know, these massive uh, intermediate sets. Um, that's just like a little generic library. It was about 70 lines of, of Unison code. Nothing to do with search engines, really. It's, you know, you could use it for lots of other stuff, too. Okay, the other thing that's used here that's new is this d-index type, which is a distributed version of that key value store type that I showed uh, a, a little bit earlier. And I'm gonna kind of dive into, into that a little bit. So we're sort of used to thinking of uh, distributed data structures, algorithms as like these very complicated things that require mountains and mountains of code, right? And uh, I feel like that's not necessarily true. I think uh, when, you're, when you have a language where it's very nice and, and pleasant to do this distributed communication, um, you're sort of able to focus on the essence of, of the, the data structure and, and the algorithm. And yeah, distributed data structures and algorithms, they work differently than their sort of, uh, you know, single machine counterparts, but, but that's fine. I mean, they're not necessarily extremely complicated. So for our distributed key value store, it's based on this very simple idea, which is that we're gonna have a directory of nodes and each node in the, in the distributed key value store has its own local uh, storage, okay? And so nodes are allowed to enter and leave the cluster that's backing the, the D index. Um, and so, we, but we sort of have this question of, if we have a key, say Alice, and we have a cluster, node one, node two, node three, how do we know what node to, or nodes to contact to do a lookup or an insert, right? We don't wanna have to you know, contact every node in the cluster because the cluster might be huge. So there's a very simple uh, approach that, that is, is used sometimes. It's called uh, rendezvous hashing or uh, highest random weight hashing. And the idea is, is this. We, we're gonna just compute a hash of the pair, uh, node one Alice, a hash of the pair, node two Alice, and so forth for, for each of our nodes. 
And we're simply going to pick the, 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 the node or nodes whose hash value is highest. And those are going to be the nodes that we consider responsible for the key, Alice. OK? So it's, it's really just a, a, a random, uniform way of partitioning our, our key space up among the available nodes. And so here's, here's sort of the, the core part of the, the Unison code where we're, we're picking it, the nodes for, for a key. Um, the, the, the important part here is we're, we're calling that hash uh, function on a pair of a node and a key. And uh, you know, we're, sorting, we're sorting by that hash. And then we're, we're, you know, we're taking the top k. So you might have some replication factor for your uh, distributed key value store. So you know, if, if one node goes down, you, know, you don't uh, lose, lose any data. But uh, OK, so that's, it's pretty simple. And, and dindex is, again, very, it's totally generic. has nothing to do with search engines specifically. It's just a generic distributed data structure. And it, I think the implementation was around 100 lines of, of pure, pure unison code. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like this. It's like simple and I, I don't know. I, it's, I feel like I'm able to focus on, on the stuff that's important about, about, the, about what, I'm, what I'm trying to do. So I haven't talked about uh, creating nodes yet. So okay, we've got this great, uh, this nice distributed data structure. We've got our, our search engine or our search lookup, uh, you know, algorithm. Uh, so, now we just need a, a massive cluster of, of Unison nodes to sort of deploy it all to, right? So there's a primitive. It's called uh, remote.spawn, and it returns a remote node. Um, and here's an example of how it's being used. So we spawn uh, a, a node. Then we transfer control of the computation to that node. And then we're going to do some other stuff. And that other stuff that we're doing, that's going to now happen on the node that we just spawned. You might ask, well, OK, we spawned a node, but where, where exactly did we, we spawn that node, right? And that is actually, it's left deliberately somewhat underspecified. So um, it might be on, literally on the same machine as sort of the, um, the originating node, or it might be just in the da same data center, or it might be sort of just in the same data center region. You know, all those might be, might be fine choices. Um, but let me just show kind of an example of how we might use this to, to provision and deploy our, our search engine. So uh, we have a node, imagine we have a node for each of the computing regions where we might want to spawn uh, new sort of computing resources. So we have a node for US East, a node for EU Central, we could have a, a node for EU West, or you know, US West, et, et cetera. And you can see, here's an example of how this could be used. Um, we create an empty uh, D index, then we're going to spawn a bunch of nodes off of the US East node. So we're basically going to be provisioning nodes from the, the US East region with, with this Unison code. And uh, we're going to do that 10,000 times. So we're going to get back this list of, of 10,000 nodes. And for each one of those nodes, we're just going to loop through it and have it join the, the D index or the cluster that's backing the D index. So, so yeah, that's, that's we're, what are we doing here? We're, we're provisioning new computing resources. We're deploying code. Uh, to, to those nodes that we've provisioned. And we're sort of, oops, we're, we're, doing, we're doing all that with just sort of ordinary Unison code. So we're not calling out to all these, you know, special purpose tools. We're just writing regular code. Any p sort of patterns we notice uh, while, we're, while we're writing this code, you know, we could factor them out into generic functions and reuse them. And, you know, this, this, is, this is the kind of thing that, that I, at least I want to be writing. Um, I don't want to have to deal with, with all these other tools when I'm, when I'm building a, a large system. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post uh, you know, sort of all the code, including these generic utilities I wrote uh, very soon on, on the Unison uh, blog, along with some sort of demo of, of the search engine actually running. But uh, yeah, I want to talk a little bit 
about how this is all done, because maybe it just seems like it's just too magical, like this can't possibly work, right? Uh, so let's, let's go back to our very simple example of factorial, Evalu just evaluating factorial at another node. So we kind of have this question, right? If we're going to evaluate the factorial function at Alice, how exactly do we tell Alice about factorial? So we could just send her the name factorial, right? But then that's, that's maybe a little too fragile, because how do we know that the, name, or the meaning that Alice has assigned to factorial is the same as the meaning that we've assigned to it? Um, you know, she could have a completely different code base with, you know, different set of libraries, right? So, so that's kind of not, it's, it's too fragile, not very scalable. So the Unison solution uh, is we're going to identify things not by their name, but by a cryptographic hash of their content. So, and it's actually a nameless, what I call a nameless hash of, of the content. So it actually doesn't matter, you know, whether we call the function factorial or whether we call it blah. Uh, it doesn't matter whether we call the parameter z or whether we call it n, it's the same function, right? And it's gonna have the same hash. Let's suppose that is, you know, Q82 something. So what we're actually sending to Alice when we send her that expression, uh, you know, factorial of n, is, is not, you know, the name factorial applied to n. We're actually sending her that hash, the hash of the specific factorial function that we're asking her to evaluate. And you can maybe see how this sort of solves the problem of, oh, how do we transport an arbitrary value, you know, including a, possibly a function to another node? Is Alice can just check her code store, she can see, oh, I already have that hash, great, uh, it's gonna be the same function, so I can just proceed with evaluation. Or if she doesn't have that hash, she can, uh, you know, ask, ask the sender, hey, I don't have that hash, can you send it to me? The sender sends her a value, she verifies the hash, adds it to her code store, it's cached for next time. So this works really well, it's, it's very robust, it, um, it almost feels like cheating, I, I mean, I, I think it's a great idea and it's, it's vastly simplified a, a lot of aspects of, of Unison's uh, runtime it's, and its implementation. But it does have some very interesting consequences, which I'll just sort of give you a, a, a sample of, um, which th these could almost be another talk in and of itself. But so it, what, it's, what it does is it changes our model of what a code base is. So we're used to thinking of a code base just like this bag of text files, right? And you just modify those text files. That's how you edit your, and evolve your code base. But in Unison, you, you don't really modify anything. So if we take our factorial function, and we modify, quote unquote, modify it. Oh, so yeah, and so remember, say it has that hash, Q82. If we now modify that to factorial of n equals 43, well, now this is actually, we haven't really modified anything. We've just simply introduced a new definition that has a completely different hash, you know, z, 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 z. And all of the references to factorial, they're, they're referring to it by hash as well. So they, they're not like automatically updated uh, to, to point to that, that new hash, and we probably wouldn't even want to do that anyway because it's not really safe. Um, so this sort of raises a lot of questions about sort of the overall programmer, you know, user experience when you're developing code. Um, like how do you do things like refactoring? Um, yeah, how do you do things like dependency management? So there's like all these calls into question and like the, sort of the basic workflow that, that we have as programmers. But uh, it turns out that there's a lot of really big benefits uh, beyond just the distributed programming stuff. There's a lot of, of big benefits to, to representing the code base as an immutable data structure. So just to at least give a preview, there's um, much better, you can have much better support for large scale refactoring than we have right now. You can have uh, much better support for dependency management. Um, and so you sort of have all these benefits that, that kind of come with that and, and 
I'd love to talk more about it, but if, if, you, if you do want to read more, there's, there's a lot more on the, the Unison uh, blog. Uh, so unisonweb.org, it's, it's, uh, it's mostly a technical blog. There's uh, design posts, there's uh, status updates, and uh, definitely encourage you to, to follow along if, if this sounds uh, interesting at all. And uh, lastly, I just want to thank, first of all, Full Stack Fest for, for putting on a, an awesome conference. Uh, yay! And, uh, <laughs> and also, just a, a number of people have been, have been helping with, with Unison, either with actually contributing code or just kind of consulting, advice, ideas. And so thank, thanks to all the folks who have been helping. Uh, oh, one last thing. Unison is, of course, open source. It's being very actively developed, so things are changing very, very rapidly, and, and definitely, you know, follow along if if you're uh, if you want to sort of see where it's going. All right, that's all I got. Thank you. <laughs> Which advantages does Unison provide over the distributed con currency model of Erlang? Yeah, I was expecting somebody to ask this, this very question. So yeah, I mean, so Erlang is, is great, and uh, you know, I think it's taught us a lot about uh, you know, how to build uh, distributed, distributed systems. Um, I think the thing, the thing that's kind of missing from Erlang is, so in Erlang, when you, you, you still have to work out some sort of protocol when you have two Erlang processes communicating, right? So you can't just send an arbitrary, well, you can't safely send an arbitrary function, for instance, to another Erlang process because uh, you don't know whether that, Erlang, that the uh, recipient is going to have sort of all the transitive dependencies of that function that you're sending. Um, so and I, I guess I'm not really an Erlang programmer, but I guess it's even somewhat frowned upon to, to, to just be sending arbitrary functions around between processes. So, so yeah, you, you still have to kind of work out some sort of communication protocol, and it's, it's definitely a lot sort of lighter weight and nicer than maybe issuing HTTP requests uh, sort of manually and, and doing like JSON parsing and so forth. But yeah, I guess it, I feel like it sort of doesn't quite go far enough. Um, and then there's sort of one, th there's one other thing which is maybe more subtle, which is that um, I, I kind of, at least I personally feel like message passing at the level of actors or, or process, processes, it's sort of, it's kind of a, a, a level, it's maybe too low level, it's, it's not really the level at which I want to program. Um, and you can maybe sort of compare it a little bit to the, to the Unison code you saw where, well, yes, we are having to send messages between these nodes to implement our, our, um, our distributed programming API, but it's sort of like, a it's sort of below the level of abstraction at which we're working. Like, it's sort of like implementation detail. Yeah, there's messages flying all over the place, but yeah, I just want to sort of declaratively specify, hey, I want this part of the computation to happen at this node, and then I want it to move to this other node, and I, so I, I just sort of like that model better. But yeah, Erlang is great, and you know, if Joe's here, I, I hope he's not too offended by, by my talk. <laughs> All right. I feel like you and uh, Sasha, from, who was speaking yesterday around Erlang and Elixir, should have a conversation in the bar, in the beach bar tonight, and anyone that's interested should sit around and see who wins. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, so another question is, can you give an example of a production system that uses Unison? Oh, uh, no, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Are these the guinea pigs? <laughs> So yeah, I mean, it's like I said, it's it's being very actively developed. It's it's not ready for production use yet. But um, so I, you know, it's it's this crazy. It started as this crazy experimental project, and uh, I was doing a lot of exploring of different ideas. I wasn't sure, you know, which ones were going to work out, and I I kind of wanted to get the ideas like to a point where I was felt good about them before really sort of putting all the engineering effort into making it like a production, you know, usable system. But, but yeah, now I, I actually do feel like the ideas are, are really solid and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to sort of putting all that engineering effort in to, to make it something you could actually, you know, really do real stuff with. <laughs> all right, well, your final question is, and you might have kind of answered it a little bit earlier, was, 
Is Unison inspired by Erlang or the Cloud Haskell project, and how would you compare them? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, to some degree, yeah, I've, I've been definitely influenced by lots of different languages. Um, I guess Cloud Haskell is, is very much, uh, inf it's very much inspired by Erlang's uh, concurren concurrency and distributed system uh, support. So yeah, I, I sort of put those in a, in a similar bucket. Uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely some inspiration from, from those, those places, so yeah. <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of a vague answer. <laughs> it, it's a big question. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, well, uh, you know, if uh, Unison becomes the, the programming language of the future for distributed systems, you heard it here first. A uh, round of applause for, for Paul Chisano. Thank you very much. Thank you.